message in a bottle has been utilized for centuries by sailors for all sorts of reasons. Some as distress signals, others for just the fun of who might find them. I think all of us at some point in our childhood dreamed of finding a washed up bottle with a treasure map crammed tightly inside. But on New Year's Eve of 2007, one would wash up and immediately question everything we thought we knew. Cheryl Wademan, her husband Gary, and brother Doug had driven to a beach near Eucla on the western Australian border to indulge in a day of beachcombing. Miss Wademan went one way, while the other two men split up to cover more ground. To anyone unfamiliar with beachcombing, it is basically what it sounds like. It is an activity that consists of scouting the beach of the inner tidal zone, searching for anything that might be of value. This beach was so secluded that it did not even have a name and had zero signs of any recent human activity. After a while of searching to no avail, she caught a glisten out of the corner of her eye, something that stopped her in her tracks. It was a glass bottle, a Bacardi bottle to be exact. It was half buried in the sand upside down. As she moved in closer, she could see a note with writing on it with the words clearly visible. Instead of popping the top right then and there, she opted to take the bottle home before carefully removing the note inside. Due to the great condition the bottle was in, they only estimated the age at around two or three years old. She would soon find out that the estimate was a bit off. When they arrived home, she carefully removed the note and began to read the words written in a washed out blue-green ink. Quote, Hi there. Out here in the lonely southern ocean and thought we would give away a free holiday in the Whitsunday Islands in North Queensland. Our ship is traveling from Fremantle, Western Australia to Queensland to work as a charter vessel. It went on to give details on how the finders of the note could contact them and claim their free vacation. Then the writer signed off with, See you soon, Jono. It was dated October 26th of 1988, a whole 20 years prior to the bottle washing up on shore and finding its way into the hands of Miss Wademan. After a bit of research, the discoverers of the 20-year-old bottle would find out the true origin story of where it had came from. The letter in the Bacardi bottle was written by John Blissett and dropped in the ocean from a yacht he was sailing on the Patanella. John and his friend Michael Calvin, along with another couple from Perth, Ken and Noreen Jones, were sailing from Fremantle to the Whitsunday Islands in eastern Australia. This letter would bring a two-decade-old mystery back to life and would begin to question everything we thought we already knew. I'm Bradley Hall, and you're listening to Beyond the Harbor. A wealthy Australian businessman, Alan Nickel, was on the hunt in 1988 for a boat to sink some cash into. Sink? Mm, Never mind. He stumbled upon a 62-foot luxurious schooner for sale. The yacht was an unmistakable royal blue, steel-hulled, elegant ship, equipped with top-of-the-line safety features for its time. It was around 30 years old and had made many voyages around the world throughout the years even setting its sails toward Antarctica. Even though it was getting up in age, it had recently undergone a $40,000 refit that included a new radar, which would emit a warning signal should another ship come within a certain range. Nickel was sold on what was called a distinctive, beautiful-looking vessel. He purchased the yacht to allow him to travel in style to and from for all of his business needs. Nothing says important businessman like arriving to work outings on a 62-foot, bright blue, flashy yacht. So the deal was done. The Patanella had a new owner. Around the same time that Nickel had purchased the Patanella, there were a couple of friends looking to get their navigation certificates and become boat captains. John Blissett, who was 23, and Michael Calvin, who was 21. According to Australian law, 
You need at least 360 days of sailing experience to be able to gain your captain's license. They were hanging out at a harbor in Fremantle and came across the beautiful yacht, bobbing in port. The yacht that Alan Nickel had just purchased a few months prior. A great idea popped into their minds that would help them gain the experience required to reach their long-term goals. They asked Nickel if they could have a job as crewmates aboard the Patanella. He agreed, and the two men were well on their way to making their dreams a reality. They were hired for an initial voyage to the Whitsunday Islands from the harbor in Fremantle where they would dock at Airlie Beach. The skipper, or captain if you will, that Nickel had recruited to navigate the yacht was a man named Ken Jones. He had help from his wife Noreen and daughter Ronna Lee who was also an adult at the time of the journey. So this brings the full passenger load of the Patanella to six people for Nickel's first trip as the new owner. For anyone unfamiliar with Australian geography like myself, Fremantle is located on the extreme southwestern part of the country. It is a harbor city for Perth. This location is where the Patanella was docked. The final destination was Airlie Beach, which was located on the extreme northeastern part of Australia in the Queensland state. The two cities were completely opposite of each other, literally cutting Australia in half. The journey would take a little over a month. This should give you a good idea of the voyage they were about to undertake. After a general inspection on October 16th, the Patanella was ready to begin the trip. The well-seasoned captain, Ken Jones, would set the sails of the 62-foot yacht to the south for the first leg of the trip for the long journey around the Great Australian Bight. Their first stop was about 600 miles away in Esperance. Upon their arrival, Alan Nickel would disembark to attend a business matter in Perth. At this point, you might be wondering why Nickel would sail out of Fremantle, 600 miles to Esperance and disembark, only to have to travel all the way back to Perth. You are not alone. He could have had pre-planned business to attend to and just wanted to be a small part of his newly purchased vessel. Or maybe he had something urgent that just came up. Either way, he would not be along for the rest of the journey. Also disembarking the same time as Nickel, was Ken and Noreen's daughter, Ronna Lee. It was said that she too had business to attend to in Perth. I wish there were more information as to why these two would travel 600 miles to seemingly jump ship, only to make the trek back to Perth. We can only work with what we know. This left four occupants on the Patanella for the remaining journey around the Great Australian Bight. Skipper Ken Jones, his wife Noreen, and the two newly hired crewmates, John Blissett and Michael Calvin. The Patanella with Ken at the helm set their sails eastward and began the second leg of the journey. Ken periodically radioed in to shore to give out their location. It is important for vessels to make contact from land from time to time, should there be an event or weather warning that they should be made aware of. The voyage seemed to be going rather normal and quiet. A few days after Nickel disembarked, he received a radio call from Ken claiming they needed money for fuel. They had docked in Portland, which was about 1,700 miles from where they dropped Nickel off in Esperance. Nickel then wired the money for fuel out to Ken. Something to note here is we cannot verify that they indeed used the funds to completely fill up the tank. I'll come back to this point in a minute. So keep this thought on your mind as we move along. On November 5th, crewmate Michael Calvin made a surprise radio call to his father, who was back home in Taree. Michael simply said, quote, Good day, Dad, before the line suddenly fell silent. November 6th and 7th continued on like any other day at sea. Ken kept regularly radioing in his position as they trekked east across the Great Australian Bight, headed towards Sydney. This brings us to November 8th of 1988. It was an overcast night with a light breeze and moderate swell. This was great sailing conditions with no storms on the horizon. Keith McLennan was manning the radio at his job with the Overseas Telecommunications Commission in Sydney. At almost 1 a.m. in the morning, he received a radio message from the Patanella. 
On the other end of the line was the voice of Ken Jones. He reported their position at 10 nautical miles east of Sydney's Botany Bay. Jones then said, quote, I believe we've run out of fuel. We've hoisted our sails and we are tacking out to the east, tracking about 080. Our intention is to tack out for a couple of hours, then tack back in. We may need some assistance in the morning to get back into Sydney Harbor. For anyone who is not familiar with sailor jargon, to tack out means that Jones was going to perform a sailing maneuver that would not require any fuel, using only the sails and wind to direct the boat. So Jones was claiming that they had ran out of fuel. They recently sailed from Esperance to Portland, which was about 1,700 miles. Before they set out from Portland, they had supposedly gotten the wire transfer from nickel to fill up the fuel tank. Now follow me here. I'm going to use a bit of math, and things may get complicated. Just hang with me. The journey from Portland to the current location 10 miles out from Botany Bay was around 1,000 miles. The second leg from Esperance to Portland was around 1,700 miles. 1,700 miles minus 1,000 miles should leave you with around 700 miles to spare, yet they had seemingly ran dry. This is a major point of contention in this story. Had they simply not completely filled the tanks? Had they sprung a leak? Did they fill half the tanks and pocket the other half of the money? I can only speculate at this point. Either way, Jones was adamant that they were indeed out of fuel. And we can confirm this due to him electing to use the term tacking out to sea, which implies only using the wind and sails. To Keith McLennan back at the communications office, this was a totally routine event. Vessels ran out of fuel quite often and requested help to make it in the harbor. Jones then made a second call to McLennan about an hour later at 1.58 a.m. He requested a weather report and stated he did not want to be caught out too far before sailing into harbor. The second half of this call is where things begin to get a bit odd. He made an unusual request of McLennan. Jones asked for directions to a town which was located on the New South Wales coast about 200 miles to the south. In order to get to Botany Bay where they were currently sitting, they had to sail right past the town to get there. McLennan replied to Jones stating that the town was about five hours away and warned him that there was a wind advisory in the area. He was a bit puzzled at the seemingly random question Jones sent his way, but thought nothing more of it. So here was the Patanella, within sight of the lights of Botany Bay, tacking back out to sea and requesting a weather report with directions to another town in New South Wales. What exactly was behind this odd behavior? Just a few minutes after the second call to McLennan, Jones would make a third and final call at 2 a.m. the morning of November 8th. This time, the call was being drowned in static. McLennan had a hard time trying to make out exactly what Jones was saying. Quote, 300 kilometers south? Is it south? Is it south? Jones's voice dwindled on the line until it returned to only static. For those of you in the U.S. like myself, 300 kilometers is approximately 185 miles, which is coincidentally the same distance between Botany Bay and the town which Jones was requesting directions to. When Keith McLennan finished his late night shift at 3.40 in the morning, he made mention of the three calls he had received from the skipper on the Patanella. Neither McLennan or his relief partner had any reason to be concerned. After a few days had passed, Alan Nickel was notified of the last call that Ken had made and what he had said about the lack of fuel. His immediate thought was that Ken had decided to go on ahead and sail straight on to Airlie Beach. The date they were scheduled to arrive was on November 18th, a whole 10 days after the last of the radio transmissions. During this 10-day timeline, Ken's son Peter had been trying to contact his father via ship-to-shore radio transmission. All the attempts he made were unsuccessful, and he knew right away something wasn't right. 
He had always been able to get in contact with his father up until this point, and his concern started to grow. On November 18th, when the Patanella failed to show up to Airly Beach, they finally decided to act on their suspicions and launch a search party. The families wanted to believe that there was still hope, but their ambitions would begin to wane as each day passed by with no news of the whereabouts of the Patanella. I can't even begin to imagine their situation, just not knowing if or when new information would come in. They were all completely on the other side of the country with no way to assist in the search efforts and most likely feeling completely helpless. Unfortunately though, the day of resolve would not come for the family members of the occupants aboard the Patanella. It appears as though they had simply vanished from the surface of the Tasman Sea. Search efforts revealed no evidence whatsoever that the yacht may have sunk to the bottom of the seabed. Crews checked all 48 vessels known to be in the area at the time and discovered no damage to any of them, hinting at some sort of hit and run collision that may have taken place. The questions were out there, but there were no new answers coming in. The Patanella, it seems, was just simply gone. Around six months after the last radio call Skipper Ken Jones made to shore on May 9th of 1989 off the coast of the Terrigal, which is about 30 miles north of Sydney Harbor, a fisherman hauled in a barnacle-covered life buoy. After scraping away at the barnacles, a name began to appear. Patanella, Fremantle. Hang around a minute and we will go into more detail on what this discovery means along with some theories as to what may have happened 10 miles off the coast of Sydney Harbor on that calm, eerie night in November of 1988. As we go along and explore some theories that have come to the surface over the years, it is important to note that these are real people that are affected in this story, many of which are still living today. After the discovery of the Patanella's life buoy, investigators immediately had it examined by marine biologists. The results revealed that the buoy could not have been in the water for no more than four weeks. This leaves a huge six-month gap in the timeline from when the last radio transmission was received. Now, I'm no marine biologist by any stretch of the imagination, but I have to wonder, did the fishermen that found the buoy, not knowing exactly what they had found, scratch away the barnacles that would have revealed that it had been in the sea for a much longer period of time? As these scientists are experts in their respected field, I have to presume they would have taken this into account, so we have to take their findings at face value. A book published in 1993 titled, Patanella is Missing, was co-authored by Robert Reed and journalist Paul Whitaker. They couldn't come to a firm conclusion on the disappearance. However, after a three-year investigation, they believe the Patanella may have collided with a large commercial vessel. This is definitely plausible. However, there is substantial evidence, in my opinion, to disprove this theory. For one, all of the vessels in the area of the Patanella's location on November 8th were investigated for damage. Nothing of interest ever came up. Sydney Harbor is undeniably a busy commercial port. However, all 48 boats in the location were confirmed to have no damage. Second, the Patanella was equipped with a fleet of radio equipment, emergency transponders, and also a radar that would alert if any other ships came within a certain range. Is it possible for all of this equipment to fail? Unlikely, but not improbable. At the very least, I would suspect the emergency transponder would have at least been able to emit a distress signal for up to 48 hours after impact. Nothing was ever detected. Investigators then turned their attention to the strange series of calls Ken Jones made to shore the morning of November 8th. Ken's son Peter was later interviewed after he had a chance to listen to the recordings of the calls his dad made to shore that morning. 
He had a strong opinion that his father was making those calls under duress. Peter said, quote, It's certainly my father's voice on the tape, but it doesn't seem to be his words. I don't think he'd ever say believed that he had run out of fuel. He's too experienced to be so vague. I think his radio calls were veiled calls for help." End quote. This theory can be supported with the math equation I presented earlier in the show as to how much fuel the ship could have had in the tanks. Alan Nichol would also agree that he did not believe they had run short on fuel due to their refilling in Portland. It is important to note here that during this series of calls between the two men, the shore radio operator, Keith McLennan, would later testify that there seemed to be, quote, no signs of distress detected in Jones's voice. So was Peter just reaching for answers here, grasping at any detail he could get his hands on to explain his father's disappearance? I don't know. But that was his father, and who else would have known him any better? Certainly not a random offshore radio operator. Alan Nickel also comes up as a source of suspicion, as some say he was trying to claim insurance fraud. I do wonder myself why he made the decision to ride only the first leg of the journey and then travel the eight hours back to Perth. But as a prominent businessman, he could have easily had something come up that he had to deal with. So I simply do not buy into this theory. Nickel also put up $30,000 of his own money to help assist in the rescue efforts. So if he was needing money from an insurance claim, that sure did not make a whole lot of sense to me. This brings us to a possible hijacking of the yacht. This to me is the most probable out of all the theories I've presented in this episode. Though it is impossible for me to say for certain, out of all the available material I've read on this story, it leads me to this conclusion. I want to point out here, some people over the years have cast skepticism on the two crewmen aboard, John and Michael, as being possibly involved in something malicious. I'm going to be careful here, as I do not wish to speak ill of the probable deceased out of respect to their living relatives. John and Michael both had dreams they were chasing, as revealed in a letter from Michael to his twin sister, Sue. The letter read, quote, Myself and John will then drive, fly, or bus back to Taree for Christmas, maybe two weeks, and then make our way back to start up our charter business on board the Patanella. We've just made a message in a bottle for a free holiday on board the Patanella. Michael was speaking of this message in a bottle that Miss Wademan would eventually find on the secluded beach nearly 20 years later. John Blissett's mother says the discovery of the bottle, quote, supports our belief that the boys were there for no other reason than adventure and that their intentions were to start a charter operation. All of this would reignite the big question weighing on everyone's minds. Just where was the Patanella? I'm going to leave you with a couple of eerie facts, or coincidences if you will, about this story. Shortly before the Patanella's voyage, there was a movie being filmed in Australia at Airlie Beach, which should sound familiar, as this was also the final target destination of the Patanella. The movie was titled Dead Calm and starred Hollywood stars Nicole Kidman and Sam Neill. The premise of this film covers a couple taking holiday, or vacation if you were in the States, who was aboard a yacht in the Whitsunday Islands when a deranged man began to terrorize the couple. A 20-year-old man was employed by the film producers to help out as a set rigger. That man turned out to be one of the crewmen aboard the Patanella, Michael Calvin. And one final note on how the ship came to get its name. The original owner of the Patanella, Bill Waterworth, chose the name because he thought it meant protective god. However, in a dead Tasmanian language that was native to Australia, the Patanella, it seems, translates to the devil. <laughs>